Okay, open your Bibles to Romans chapter 8. I was telling some of the young people earlier that uh, Martin Luther said that Romans was the crown of the whole Bible. And he said Romans chapter 8 is the crown jewel of the Bible. It's the big, bright, shining jewel in the middle of the crown. And so when I was thinking about identity, uh, when Craig called uh, a while back and said, can you do these messages on identity? And I was thinking about the identity we had before. And then the identity, and that was Romans 1 and 2, and then the identity that we have now. And if we're recapping here, um, I find my identity in, and I'm just going to recap what we said in that last message. Um, that Romans chapter 3 is said that his righteousness has now been imputed, and that was a big word, um, so I'll put the word credited, his righteousness credited to my account. Um, so I find my identity in the righteousness of Jesus and not in my own works, not in what I can do, because I'd never be good enough for him, my works would never be good enough for him, but his righteousness is good enough for him. And so I find my identity in the fact that Jesus died uh, and rose again and that I could be in the beloved and so in that I could be found in the beloved and so part of that identity the last message which was Romans chapter 6 is that I'm dead to sin my old man's been crucified I'm no longer a slave to sin my new identity is I am a slave to righteousness Now I'm a slave to righteousness, God says. And this is uh, starting to shape um, the identity in, that I want you to find yourself in. But um, that message was titled the Victor. Your identity now is a victor over sin. Your identity here is in Christ. You are righteous. That's your identity. In Romans chapter 8, it is triumphant. And so I just want to slow down. I don't want to rush, not a screamer kind of message. I just want you to enjoy and bask in the glory that is Romans chapter 8. So we're going to read Romans 8 together, the majority of it at least. And I just want to highlight a few things about your identity that you can find here. So that way for the rest of your life, when you think about identity, you can think, I can go to Romans and I can find who I am. And I want that to be true. So Romans 8 in verse 1. Um, is a famous verse, and rightfully so. There is now, based on our righteousness being in Christ, us being in the beloved, us being a slave to righteousness, based on our identity that he's laid out in the previous chapters, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And the King James says, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Take that in. Like, you've all messed up. And you've all uh, felt condemned. It says Satan, the word says that Satan is the accuser of the brethren. I just wonder how many times, you know, it's funny. Um, our family's going on a vacation this summer and it involves a beach. And so anytime you're going on a beach vacation, you think, okay, I got to eat right. I got to work out. I got to be ready for a beach vacation. If you don't think that, uh, I at least think that. And so I, um, oh, um, so I'm getting ready for this beach vacation, but, um, my wife the other day, I don't know what in the world woman's thinking, but she makes these cookies and they're like health cookies because they have like half the sugar of a normal cookie, but they have like white chocolate things and cranberries and they're delicious for like health cookies. And they're not health food. But I haven't eaten that many carbs, and I've been, like, real disciplined. But once I had one of those cookies, I'm like, I'm just going to have a half a cookie. And I eat that half cookie, and I'm like, I want more cookies. <laughs> and I end up eating, like, two full cookies, you know. Because after I ate that first half, I'm like, well, I've already lost it tonight. I might as well just have another cookie. And that's kind of the way that we are a lot of times. And it's the way that the accuser of the brethren wants you to think. Well, I've already, this has already happened in my life. 
it uh, doesn't even matter if I just this and this and this and this. And that's, that's the wrong mentality. Um, when you start with the mentality that I'm a, I'm a slave to righteousness, and if I fall down, I've got to get right back up. I can't let the accuser of the brethren sit there and berate me and tell me I'm terrible and it doesn't matter to God and that I can continue in sin. And then I can move from being a slave to righteous and move back into the old man, the dead man. I'm going to resurrect my old man and, and it just doesn't matter because I, I'm condemned as it is. God doesn't love me. Nobody cares. Nobody would notice this defeatist mentality that whenever a person sins, they're so quick to just mail it in. Well, I ate half a cookie. I guess I'll just eat the rest of the bowl. That's not your life. That's not who you are. If a man stumbles, let him get up again. Romans 8, 1 says, there is no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. Can you look at yourself through that lens? I'm not condemned. No matter what kind of secret things have been happening in your life that nobody has known about, talking to one of the brothers after the last session and said, no matter what your past is, your, your future is not determined by the mistakes of your past, by your cultural background. God is willing to write your future based on who you are. And he can take that in any direction he wants. And Romans 8 starts out, this glorious chapter starts out, there is no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus and then um, I'm going to skip a few verses just for time's sake and uh, beautiful verses in two through five, but I'm going to skip all the way down to verse six. To be fleshly minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. The fleshly mind is hatred towards God. It's not subject to the law of God and it cannot be. They that are in the flesh cannot please God, but you are not in the flesh if the spirit but in the spirit, if the spirit of God is dwelling in you. If any man doesn't have the spirit, he's none of his. But if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him that raised Jesus up from the dead dwells in you, he that raised Christ up from the dead shall quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwells in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors. We're obligated not to the flesh, to live after the flesh. If you live after the flesh, you will die. But if through the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. It says in 14, as many as are being led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Now, it, we've had a lot of talk about the spirit here. And, and if you go back to verse nine, it says, you're not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if the spirit of God dwells in you. That's a, pause, that's a powerful phrase. If the spirit of God dwells in you. And how many of you genuinely believe the spirit of God, the Holy Spirit dwells in you? Little show of hands, not so high. Okay, almost all of you believe that about yourselves. And so it says, if his spirit is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. That life that he's talking about, you get to fully enter into that life and live that life with him now into all of eternity because the spirit of God is working in you to will and to do of his good pleasure. That's powerful. You're, you, all of you who raise your hand, you're debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. If you live flesh, you're going to die. But through the Spirit, you can put to death the deeds of the body and live. 14, as many as are led by the Spirit, they're the sons of God. Now, I want to enter into this idea right here. They are the sons of God. Sons and daughters, of course, of God. What does that mean to you, that part of your identity is the Son of God? That you're God's sons and daughters. If you remember the first message, you're, 
You're in sin. You're abominable. You're a hater of God. You're a lover of all evil things, unrighteousness, ungodliness, wickedness. And then now you enjoy the station of God's own son. What does that, what does that mean? Um, I want to go to the next verse to start to explain that. You have not received a spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are His children. I was talking to one of my friends in Lubbock and he recently went to Asia and he adopted a son. Now, how many of you have personal experiences with adoption? When I say personal, somebody in like your family was adopted and so you're very familiar with adoption. Okay, so there's the three of you who were adopted and your brother was adopted. So you brought somebody into your family. Um, everybody has a different story with adoption. But the, the beautiful illustration that he brings in here with adoption, um, I called my friend. I said, hey, can you just talk to me about what it was like to adopt this kid out of Asia? In case that kid ever listens to this message, I'm not going to say his name. and I'm not going to say his country. I'm just going to say my friend. Um, I'll call him Mike. And um, this is amazing. He texted me this because he started telling me. And I was like, hey, can you just text me that? Because I'm not going to remember all that. So I'm going to read what he said. My friend texted me, when we picked Mike up from the orphanage, there was a very visual identity switch that happened. When we picked him up, he's wearing these dirty, stained clothes. He had um, lice out all over his, all in his hair. Um, his hair was like unkept and greasy. It felt so spiritually significant for us to take his clothes off to give him new clothes, to bathe him, treat his lice, give him a clean, that this baby's laying there in a soiled diaper with lice crawling through his head, unkept, unwashed. He said it was terrible. To give him a clean diaper and call him by his new name. Another spiritual thing that we saw is even though Mike's status as our son and redemption into our family, he didn't fully trust us yet. He didn't function like one of our family quite yet. He had an experience living in discipline. He went through this growing up process to function like a son, understanding that he was safe, that he was loved, to be at peace, and to know that we were never going to forsake him. It reminded us so much of sanctification and how we're growing in our relationship with Christ to understand his love for us, the height, depth, and breadth of it. We're learning what it means to belong to God, to be his sons. He didn't have much of a future in a natural sense when we adopted him. Most of the orphans in his area go on to be poor and homeless, but the moment we adopted him, he had a future, and he became a co-heir. He puts his other two kids' names in here, my biological children. He's a co-heir to my estate, and he has all the same rights and privileges of my sons. I know this kid, so it's meaningful for me to see this kid going from the gutter and now to become a prince. The envy of all the world, of uh, orphanages all over the world, is this kid who these people went, and there's an orphanage full of all these little kids. They're all dirty and whatever. And he picked up this kid, and he goes, this is my son. And from the moment he said, this is my son, and he filled out that adoption paperwork, that kid is, is his kid now and has all the same rights to sonship that his other two little kids have. That's you. You have trouble picturing yourself as that little kid in the gutter full of lice and with a soiled diaper that God went and took you out of your sin and out of your misery and exalted you to the status of an heir 
the next verse in 17 says, if children, if we are made God's children, we are heirs of God. We are joint heirs with Christ. You're not just adopted into his family. You're not just forgiven for your sins. It's one that I forgot to put up here. Forgiven. You're not just redeemed. You're not just reconciled to God, brought back into a relationship. You have been made a son of God and a co-heir with Christ. That's your identity. Your royalty. How many of you woke up this morning and you, you opened your eyes and you said, praise the Lord. I'm royalty. I'm the beloved of God. Accepted and forgiven. Perhaps you should take this list and you should wake up every morning and you should have it written down. And the first thing when you open up your eyes you go through and you say, Lord, thank you that you made me righteous. You credited and imputed the righteousness of Christ that I'm accepted in the beloved. I'm no longer a slave to righteousness because I've been redeemed, reconciled, and forgiven. I'm not only a slave to righteousness, but the epitome, the apex is I'm God's son and God's heir. And you will enjoy that status for all of eternity. I heard a story about Elizabeth. <clears throat> she didn't expect to be queen um, because it was a weird thing where she was like, her uncle was the one who was in line to be king, I guess, and so not her dad. And so she was living this life that was like lowly. It was like a base, living for pleasures and just whatever. She was just living, you know how some of those British royalty kids can be. <laughs> She's just living that life. And then something happens with her uncle or whatever. And so her dad is now exalted to the place where he's going to be the king. And she realizes I'm his only heir. And so somebody went to her and was like, hey, the who you are is totally different than who you were. What happened? And she said, when I realized that I was royalty and the place that I was going to take, it changed everything. I had to live like a queen. It just snapped. It just went off in her brain. I've not been living the life of a queen. You are a co-heir with Christ. Have you been living a life of royalty? Have you been living like a queen? You're not that base sinner any longer in the gutters. If the Spirit dwell in you, you are on path to being recognized by all the world as a son or a daughter of God. That is your identity. That's unbelievable. I don't even have to tell you you don't deserve that. It's hard to even embrace that. The guys on the front porch said the hardest thing about identity is to believe that it's all true. I know. Because it's high. It's exalted. It's beautiful. It's wonderful. It's a greater rags to riches story than has ever been told by Disney or any other filmmaker. You are the greatest rags to riches story that has ever been told. 17, if children heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ, if so be we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified with him. And I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. You're on track for this glory that's going to be revealed. And the sufferings of this present time, they're just, they're mud pies. They're just nothing. They don't matter compared to the glory that was going to be revealed in us. I probably need to give you the mud pies reference. Let me, um, sorry, I should have had that pulled up. 
Uh, it came up in the guys know C.S. Lewis, Mud, Pies. C.S. Lewis said, we are half-hearted creatures fooling around with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered to us. We're like ignorant children who want to go on making mud pies in the slum because they cannot imagine what is meant by an offer of holiday at the sea. We're far too easily pleased. Paul says that the suffering of this present time, they aren't worthy to be compared with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of all of creation waits for the manifestation of the sons of God. Who are the sons of God? Who are the sons of God? Who are these royal ones? Who have you adopted? All of creation is waiting for it, and it's going to be you. On that day, they're all going to be shocked. They're like, what? That's amazing. Look at how the bride has come together and is ready for the sun. This is the most beautiful thing creation has ever experienced. The creation was made subject to vanity, not willingly by him who subjected it in hope, because the creation itself shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the sons of God, the children of God. You're going to inherit all of these things. The whole creation is groaning and travailing in pain. We also, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, we groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. We were saved with this hope of this glorious redemption, adoption, our bodies being redeemed, inheriting His kingdom. This future is glorious. And that's who you are. You're an heir of that glorious future. We were saved for that hope in mind. I'll just keep reading. I was going to skip this portion, but I think I've got time. Likewise, the Spirit helps our infirmities. We don't even know how we ought to pray, but the Spirit Himself makes intercessions for us with groanings that couldn't be uttered. I mean, he wants us to be there, so He's interceding for us. He's helping us. He that searches the heart and mind knows the mind of the Spirit. He makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. We know all things work together for good to them who love God and who are called according to His purpose. The ones He foreknew, He also predestined to become conformed to the image of His Son that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. That's you. You're the many brethren that he's going to be the firstborn amongst. He predestinated you. He called you. He justified you. And it says at the end of verse 30, those whom he justified, which is this righteous accreditation up here on the board, those whom he justified, he also glorified. He in somehow in his mind outside of time, when he justified you, he prepared you for glory, to inherit a kingdom and to rule in righteousness alongside the Son because you're a co-heir with Christ. That's spectacular. And what does, God, what does he say to that? Paul, when he thinks of it, he says, what shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who could be against us? If that's the case, and if we believe the scripture is true, and God was so for you that he declared you righteous, picked you up out of the slum, adopted you into his family, made you right with him, put you on this track towards this glorious future, and God says, that he's began a good work, he's going to complete it, and that all things are going to work together for good to all those that are called according to his purpose. He set this whole thing in motion. And when Paul looks, steps back and looks at it, he says, if God be for us, who could be against us? We talked about the accuser of the brethren earlier. He's against us, but God is for us. We talked about the pressures of the world out there on the porch. The pressures of the world are against you. But if God is for you, what is the pressures of the world that are against you? The weakness of your flesh, it may be against you. But God is for you that you would overcome and fulfill his glorious future that he has charted out for you. Because you're an overcomer. That's your identity, is as an overcomer. 
Verse 32, he that spared not his own son, but delivered him up from all of us, how will he not freely give us all things? Who could lay a charge against God's elect? It is God that justifies. Who is he that condemns? It's Christ that died, rather is risen again, and is the right hand of God is making intercession for us. Who can separate us from the love of God? Tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, sword. As it is written, for their sakes I'm killed all day long. We're counted as sheep for the slaughter. But in all of these things, in verse 37, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. I feel like I lean right now. Guys, sometimes it doesn't feel like it, and I recognize that. In this world, you don't always feel like a conqueror, an overcomer. You don't always feel righteous. But as the guy said out there, the hardest thing about identity is entering into it, trusting God and believing it's true. And when you start to fully believe it's true, you're going to see the effects of that in your daily life. Because you're going to wake up and you're going to tell yourself, I'm righteous, I'm forgiven, um, I'm in the beloved. I'm a slave to righteousness today. Therefore, I'm going to serve righteous. And the result is holiness, which is going to lead to everlasting life. I'm a son of God. I've been redeemed and reconciled in all day long today. Who I am at my inner core is I'm a conqueror because I'm God's son or daughter. <clears throat> Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. I am persuaded neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things to come, nor things present, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Not only are you in the beloved, you are the beloved. Did somebody just say amen? Yeah, that's exactly right. Not only are you in the beloved, you are the beloved. Amen. Thank you. Okay. Um, it's my last talk, so I'm going to close it out here. What's, what's the purpose of the conference? I want to recap. I want to make sure that you're not in sin, but that you're in Christ. That was message number one. And that you understand... If you're in sin, how to come into Christ. It's Romans 1, 2, and then highlights in Romans 3, in that beautiful passage, 21 to 26. I, I need you, if this identity topic is going to be powerful, effectual, meaningful in your life, then when you're having struggles, you have to stop and think, am I finding my identity in what I do or in who I am? Am I finding my identity in where I'm from or in who I am? Am I finding my identity in how I'm seen or in who I really am? Because what you do doesn't really matter that much. Roles, work, sports, hobbies, academics, in the end, it just doesn't matter. But you know what's going to matter in the end? That you're in the Beloved. Where you come from, your culture, and the color of your skin, and your location, and what family you're from, the fact that I'm a collier, and all those things in the end, that doesn't really matter. It doesn't matter that I'm called collier. What matters is that I'm called Christ's. How people see me on social media. Somebody told me a while back they got off social media. I was like, that sounds liberating. So I got rid of all social media, except LinkedIn, which is pretty boring. <laughs> You know what? I miss a few things every now and then, like somebody's pregnant, somebody's kid. I know it's all like 40-year-olds that are on Facebook, but I'm sure you have your social media equivalent to what Facebook does for my generation. And what I miss in that, you know what I gain from that? There's no keeping up with the Joneses. I don't know what the Joneses are doing. I don't know who's doing their little pretty selfie 
and posting it online, and, and I don't care. It frees up my capacity and my mental space to not focus on how I'm seen, but to focus on who I am. And it's liberating. It's not who you know. None of these things give you value in your life. But let me tell you what does give you value in life. To wake up in the morning and when you're going through a hard time, say, the God of heaven loves me. And he's made me a conqueror. And even through these hard times, the spirit is interceding for me. The son died for me. And if God be for me, who could be against me? And that is true power in your situations. And everything else is powerless to help you emotionally and situationally to thrive in hard times. And everybody in this room is going to face hard times. One of the brothers said, yeah, I had these kids and these kids, but uh, in this little area, I lost a child. You want to talk about pain. When you get married and you lose a child, that's pain. How do you get through pain like that? You talk about pain. You go to college and you face social rejection because you don't fit the bill that everybody expects or wants in this fraternity or sorority or other dumb thing. And everywhere you turn, you just face massive rejection from your peers. Where do you turn when you face real pain? you turn to social media, you're going to find it to be so empty. And you're going to find your soul, that this is the pain that the, these things just don't, don't give you any genuine, true peace. But when you're resting in the beloved, and you know what? I have value because the God of heaven reached down into the pit and he chose the worst of sinners and he made him not only a saint, not only a holy one, but he made me his son. He made me an heir. And when the manifestation of the sons of God happens, when his kingdom comes back and the judgment seat of Christ happens and all of creation is being saying, who's the son of God? Who's the son of God? Who's the son of God? And they look up and the God of heaven looks at me and says, well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into my joy. That matters. That is true value that can touch your soul in hard times. Because your life has meaning apart from what you do and where you're from and how you're seen. Your life has eternal meaning. It has eternal value. But you have to set some of this junk aside and step into your true identity to start to realize, enter into, appreciate, live in that identity. And let me just say, I'm preaching to myself and I'm letting you listen. I need to enter into this identity just as much as all of you do every single day because my life has real pain too. But that is why the people who organize this conference, which I think they're doing all over the country, ask all the guys that are preaching, guys like me, to teach you on identity because it matters how you see yourself. So I beg you, start looking at yourself through this lens right here. Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you that you say I am loved. Even when I don't feel it, you say I'm loved. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your generosity in adopting us into your family. Thank you for your generosity in making us heirs. Now, Lord, I just want to pray that this reality, we know your word is true and is absolute authority. It's right. So, Lord, I just want to pray that we would believe it, we could enter into it, and that this 
doctrine, this idea that we've been discussing all day today, I just want to pray that it would be powerful in the lives of all of these young people and in my life as well. And God, we just want to thank you from the bottom of our hearts that you have made us your sons and that we're accepted in the beloved. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.